Hello friends, uh, my name is Pastor Desire. I am so grateful to the Lord for having given me this opportunity to proclaim His Word. These are a series of expositions of God's Word that we are starting at Kwetu Talanta TV. And my prayer is that you will be listening to these teachings on this channel that I've mentioned above. And I am praying that by listening to these teachings, you love the Lord more and you will desire to grow into his likeness. Uh, in these uh, expositions that are of mentions of God's word, uh, today we will start with the book of uh, Colossians. And I'm going to read God's word. Um, my focus will be on verse 1 and 2. But for the sake of context, let's read you know, from verse 1 to verse 8. Colossians chapter 1 from verse 1 to verse 8. But I've, as I've said, my focus will be so much on uh, verses 1 and 2. Here is the word of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. To the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing as it is as it also does among you since the day you had it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Let's go before the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us grasp what he wants us you know, to learn in this word. Heavenly Father, this is your word. And we know very well that it is meant to teach us, to rebuke us, to correct us, and to train us in righteousness so that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so, Lord, it is my prayer that you would open our eyes so that we may behold wonderful things in your life. I pray for each and every listener that you bless them, that you open their hearts and make them receptive of your word. I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now let's begin our studies. Um, I will start by giving you a little bit of a background so that we will understand uh, what is the intention of Paul in writing uh, this uh, epistle of uh, Colossians? You know, the book of Colossians is about the incomparable Christ. It is about the soul sufficient Christ. It is about the sovereign Lord in whom we have everything that we need in life. Um, the book of Colossians, or, 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 or let me say, the gospel of Jesus Christ was not you know, brought to the Colossian church you know, directly by Paul. Uh, like you know, we've read, you've heard actually you know, from verse 7, uh, he has mentioned somebody. And who is that? In verse 7, chapter 1, we read that, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved. So, um, there's more probability that the church at Colossae apparently got its start, you know, during Paul's you know, three-year uh, ministry in Ephesus. When actually you look at, uh, at the map, Colossae, the city of Colossae, was just uh, over a hundred miles east of Ephesus. That is approximately uh, 161 kilometers. And so this man, you know, went 
you know, while Paul is in Ephesus, you know, preaching the gospel, and he had, you know, the gospel uh, being proclaimed, proclaimed by Paul, and he responded positively, you know, to, to that gospel. After believing the gospel that, you know, Paul was preaching in Ephesus, uh, Epaphras returned uh, to his hometown and began, you know, sharing the same gospel that he had, you know, from Paul. As a result, friends, the Colossian church was born. The Colossian church was established. Now, at this time of writing, Epaphras is back to visit, you know, Paul in Rome. And uh, while with Paul, you know, he shared the bad news that there was a dangerous teaching that was a threat, you know, the Colossian church. Now, where do you do we know that exactly uh, Paul, Epaphras, you know, had gone back, you know, to visit Paul in Rome? Look at, for instance, you know, in chapter in chapter four, uh, verse twelve. Chapter four, uh, verse twelve. The Bible says that Epaphras, this is Paul, you know, writing. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always, struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. See. Paul is writing, you know, this later while being with Epaphras. And, you know, when Epaphras had visited Paul, he had reported what is happening, you know, back uh, in the Colossian church. That, you know, there is a false teaching that is threatening, that is threatening, you know, the church. And now Paul writes, you know, this later to respond to this situation and to encourage believers in their growth toward Christian maturity. Let me give you just a picture. As we go, you know, chapter by chapter, portion by portion, you will come to understand what kind of teaching that Paul is talking about in this Colossian book. But let me give you just a picture of what kind of false teaching that was threatening, you know, the uh, Colossian, uh, the, the Colossian, the Colossian church. You know, these were teaching um, that, that I would call a nerd mixture of Christian, you know, truths uh, with the Jewish ritual practices mm -hmm. and even pagan, pagan beliefs and practices. They are not outrightly, you know, denying Christ. This false teacher did not, you know, deny Christ. They, they did not outrightly deny Christ. But they are mixing the gospel of Christ with truth and error. Paul will outline for us, you know, in chapter 2 uh, specifically, um, some of the distinctives of, uh, of this false, false teaching. For instance, you know, in chapter, in chapter 2, uh, verses 11, you know, uh, 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul tells us, you know, these, these false teachers apparently were requiring, you know, uh, believers, um, gentle Christians to obey the Old Testament ritual law. I'm just, like I said, I'm just giving you a, you know, a clue, you know, a picture of, you know, uh, the kind of uh, uh, false teaching that were threatening, you know, the church back then. Uh, in that same uh, chapter, that is chapter 2, just a little bit, you know, further on, you'll notice, especially in verses, uh, in verse 18, in verse 18, uh, these people were teaching that we ought to worship angelic mediaries, see? The worship of angels, apparently, you know, for these false teachers was part of their bag of tricks. Mm? And thirdly, notice in, in, in chapter 2, verse 20 and 23 to 23, you see that, you know, these teachers are also teaching sort of what we call asceticism. Asceticism, it may sound like, you know, you know very hard terminology to understand, but asceticism is simply a bodily form of excessive self-denial. These some these were some of you know the kind of uh, teachings that you know these false preachers were you know uh, teaching the uh, Colossian the Colossian uh, believers. And so all these all these teachings were being you know add uh, mixed. They were a mixture of truth and error, you know. And according to Paul, um, these teachings were not, were not only, you know, changing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, but they were also, you know, um, 
threatening, they were endangering the spiritual lives of, uh, of believers at Colossae. Because, you know, we all know that, you know, um, truth is unto godliness. And untruth leads to destruction. Friends, Paul, Paul's one answer to this erroneous teaching is none other than the person and the work of Jesus Christ. In fact, the message of the book of uh, uh, Colossians is, is that, you know, believers are complete in Christ. And that faith in Christ necessarily rules out in reliance on anything outside of Christ. Now, let's go deeper and see what, you know, the Holy Spirit wants us, you know, to learn today. Uh, let's go back, you know, to the scriptures. That was just, you know, a little bit of a background to give you a picture on what Paul wants us, you know, to grasp. Let's go back, you know, to the, uh, um, you know, our passage. You know, I've read from verse 1 to verse 8, but like I said, my focus will be so much on uh, verse, the first two verses, verse 1 and verse 2. And these verses, let me read them once more. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God, our Father. There are certain, you know, major points, or main points that I want us, you know, to look together into this uh, portion of, of God's word. Number one, when I look at, you know, at verse one, the, the, the first main point that I get, you know, from what, verse one, is that, you know, God calls you to receive the scripture as authoritative in all matters of faith and, and life. That is, that is part one. That is the main point that actually I'm getting out, you know, from verse one, the first main point. And let me repeat it again so that you may, you know, get it properly. God calls you to receive scripture, his word, as authoritative in all matters of, you know, faith and life. Look at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. You see, look at the, this uh, uh, assertion, you know. Uh, Paul's claim begins first, you know, by this assertion, you know. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. You see, that phrase is an assertion of Paul's authority. And this actually reminds us, ladies and gentlemen, of the importance of the authority of the scriptures in our experience, in our experience. Most of us, you know, struggle not in the area of, uh, you know, openly rejecting the scriptures. No. See, like I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, these people we, we did not out, you know, did not deny completely, you know, the scripture. They did not completely reject, you know, the gospel. But, you know, they kept mixturing, they kept, you know, mixturing, you know, errors with the gospel, you see. We may not openly, I and you may not openly, you know, reject the scriptures. But, you know, sometimes you, you realize that in your own life and in my own life, that often... We have the problem of a practical denial of the word of God. See, in our lives, we say that, you know, the word of God is the authority uh, in our lives. That it is the authority, but, but we live as if, you know, this word of God is not really authoritative. See? Now, friends, the scriptures, remember, this is the infallible. This is the inerrant the inspired word of God that anybody should question. We have to receive God's word. Remember that we are talking about you know, the authority of scriptures in our lives. That we are to receive scriptures as authoritative in all matters of you know faith and and life. And we may not you know reject the scriptures like these first preachers. We may not you know reject the scriptures openly but when you try you know, to examine your, your life sometimes you realize that you know practically speaking you deny what you know the scriptures you know command us to do now for instance we say that you know it is the authority but we live as if you know it were not you know the authority 
in our lives. You know, I have uh, one lecturer, he's a friend of mine, and he's my lecturer as well. You know, I like, you know, something that he does always when he's teaching, you know, the Word of God. He, he says that, you know, the scriptures, or the, the script, you know, this is the Word of God. This is the Bible. And so the Bible, since we say, you know, the Bible is above us. The Bible is authoritative over all matters of faith and life. It should not be like this. See, some people, you know, have put, you know, have put, you know, the Bible under, you know. So they try, you know, to command the Bible. They try to tell the Bible what it should say. But the reality is what we are talking about. The scripture should be above us, you know, like this. These are, this is an example of one, you know, of my lectures, you know. Whenever he's preaching, you know, that's what he does. And I like it. The scripture should be above us, you know. We are not to tell the scriptures to say what we want. But the scriptures should judge us. The scriptures should tell us, you know, what to do. Not us, you know, to tell the scriptures, you know, what it should say. All right? So, because it is authoritative over our, our lives. Now, let's look at... Um, um, actually, there is one quotation, one quote, great quote that I like, you know, from John Calvin. John Calvin, uh, you know, said a long time ago that the Bible is the scepter by which the heavenly king rules his church. Are you that kind of a person that, you know, hungers and thirsts for the word of God? How many times do you read the Bible with your family in the corporate worship? with the small group. How many times do you take, you know, the Bible and meditate upon it? How many times do you contemplate on the scriptures? Because if we do not read the scriptures, if we don't meditate on the word of God, this is one of the signs that we are practically denying it is authority. Friends, love the Word of God. Read it frequently. Study the Word of God. Meditate upon it. Be uh, such people who have a hunger and a thirst for the Word of God. We are to receive the Scriptures as authoritative in all matters of faith and practice. And actually, that's what you know, Paul starts by saying, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, See, Paul is telling people that, you know, the, 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 the word of God that you're reading in this Colossian book, it is not my own words, Paul is saying. No, it is the inspired word that have been, you know, given by the Holy Spirit, you know, to declare to you. It is authoritative. Now, let's look, you know, at verse um, 2. Verse 2. Verse 2, he, he talks about, you know, the saints. He says, the saints... To the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Let me start, you know, by the word saints. Actually, you know, Paul is what Paul is doing in this verse too. He is reminding you believers that you are chosen by God. You are set apart. You are dedicated to be his own people. He says, to the saints and faithful brothers. In Christ at Colossae. Friends, when Paul says to the saints at Colossae, he doesn't mean to those extraordinarily holy people who are members of the congregation. But, you know, the hallmark, the whole, the hallmark is that um, he's talking about, you know, all the members of the congregation. Did you know that you know there are certain people who think that you know they are more holier than others? For instance, you know there we have certain religions whereby you know there are certain individuals that are only allowed to be called your know, saints. The rest you can't you can't you know address them you refer to them as saints, but that is that's not you know biblical that's not what the scripture says. You see, Paul is addressing he's talking he's writing to the saints he's, 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 he's talking he is writing to the. Uh, uh, Colossian believers, and he did not, you know, divide in categories that, that these are saints, these are not saints. No, he's saying you are all saints, you are all saints, and that's what you find in verse two. He says to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. 
you know, those whom God has chosen for himself. Those who have been set apart you know, by God for his own, you know, to be his own people. And actually, this is, a, this is the relationship. This is our, you know, the, the, the sainthood, you know, when he speaks of saint, this is our relationship, you know, to, to God. Okay? The relationship to God, that's what I'm saying, you know, is underscored by the word, you know, saints. Like, our relationship to one another is underscored, you know, by the word brother or brethren, that, like we will see in this verse too. So our relationship, you know, with God is underscored by the word saint. So we are all saints. So long as, you know, you are a genuine believer, so long as, you know, you are a Christian, you are a saint. That's what you know the scriptures, you know, says to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Um, how do you understand when, you know, it is actually amazing. Remember, this terminology, this kind of language was only being addressed, you know, to the Jewish, to the Jewish people, the Jews. But now, this is a Gentile Christian. And Paul is telling them that, you know, since you have received the Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have changed you know, your status has changed. You are now called saints. You are called, you know, saints. Remember, in the Old Testament, he did not choose, you know, the Israelite because uh, they were, you know, the greatest. In fact, you know, they, if you look at, you read the scriptures, you know, they were, you know, the least nations. See? Now, he did not choose them, you know, for, 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 for anything in them. But it was because he loved them. We are taught in you. For instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, look at that chapter, you'll, you'll find it. He says, that, you know, he chose the Israelites to be a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And now the Apostle Paul says to, the, to these Gentiles in Colossae, as far as I and you are concerned, that we are now saints. This is the truth of God's electing love. He has sought us, ladies and gentlemen. He has sought us. Before we came to him, he came to us. Now, what qualifies us to be called, you know, saints? Look at, for instance, in verse 2. You know, all the answers in the scriptures and the word of God. Look at, for instance, in verse 2. The Bible says, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ. See, the word, in Christ. When you are in Christ, you are automatically qualified to be called a saint. It is only those who are in Christ that are called saints. That's what the scripture says. If you are in Christ, don't allow anybody to undermine you by calling you your know, certain names, by demeaning your personality, by calling you whatever. No, you are saint by the fact that you're in Christ. That itself you know, qualifies you to be called, you know, a, a saint. And so, this, ladies and gentlemen, should, you know, cause us to love the Lord more. Should cause us, you know, to worship Jesus Christ. Like he called the people of Israel when they were least, the least nation. He did not, he, he did not base, you know, his electing, electing love on anything. No, it was because of, you know, riches in mercy and love. The same to us happened. God did not, you know, love us. God did not, you know, elect us. God did not choose us because we deserved it. No, it is because of his love, because of his grace that we, you know, happen to be called, you know, saints. And that actually should cause us. That actually should motivate you to love the Lord. If the Lord had not chosen us, if the Lord has not, had not elected us, all of us, would, we deserved to die. But he loved us and he chose us. That should lead us into fully worshiping him and prioritizing him above everything. Let me remind you again, Christians, you are chosen by God. You are set apart. You are dedicated to be his own people. Now, let's continue to read. In verse 2, uh, he says that um, uh, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. See? Now, there's another point that I'm getting, you know, from this verse. You and I, so long as we are Christians, genuine Christian in Christ, we are in Christ, 
Now he's saying that Christians, in response to God's initiative, now, are faithful or loyal to their calling. Now, based on what you know the Lord has done for us, based on his grace, based on, on you know the electing love, the scripture is saying that we have to be faithful and loyal to our calling. The faithful, this, this is the word that actually I'm basing on. He says, and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. The faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. This word from Paul is a stimulus. It is an encouragement to faithfulness, to obedience. You know, we have been made to, to be the true Israel now. We are the true Israel. Though formerly we used to be Gentiles, but because we are now in Christ, we are the true Israel. We have made, you know, we, we have been chosen by God. And as we have been dedicated by Him, we are to be loyal to God. Friends, do you reflect in your own experience, that kind of reality is faithfulness, something that you know characterizes you. Because he's saying that you know automatically believers are faithful. Now, my question to you and to me is: Are you is faithfulness something that characterizes your life? Are you loyal to God? You know, is God your priority? You know, I like um, there's uh, one man. Is a writer of books is called you know A. W. Toza, one of you know his quotes that really has you know uh, that that has blessed me so much. You know A. W. Toza said, I'm quoting him, the Bible recognizes no faith that does not lead to obedience. Nor does it recognize in obedience any obedience that does not spring from faith. You know, these are two you know. These two are uh, uh, are opposite, you know, sides of, uh, are the two opposites of, of the same coin. See, the Bible does not recognize any faith that does not lead to obedience. So you say, and I say that I believe in Jesus Christ. He's my Lord and Savior. I have faith in God. But when you look at your life uh, or my life, it actually denies my profession or my confession in Christ. So if my life opposes, if my life differs from what I profess to be, then according to A.W. Tosa, that kind of faith is a counterfeit. That kind of faith is not real. Because if you have real faith in Jesus Christ, automatically this faith will lead into obedience. You live an obedient life, you know, to, to the Lord. Oh, it's my prayer. It is my prayer. But, friends, when we go out there, in our families, in every area where we are, that the Lord, that the Lord will be reflected. Not only with our words, but with our lives. Because the moment our lives our lives operate differently from our faith, then there's a question whether our faith is genuine. If we have genuine faith in the Lord, this faith will lead us into obedience. It is an automatic, it is an automatic thing. Then uh, we are in verse 2, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ, you know, at Colossae. Now look at this. Now Christians, believers, in virtue of uh, their relation to God, are now all brothers. We are all brothers. That's what the scripture says. Faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. In verse 2. They are not simply faithful. Like, you know, they are not simply faithful, but faithful brothers or faithful brethren. Friends, this, this must bring, you know, to um, mind that 
kind of unity that we have as brothers in Christ. We are united. You know, the people, believers from, uh, from America, believers from Africa, believers from Australia, be, you know, we are all brothers in Christ. Christ has brought us, you know, together. Christ has united us together and has become, you know, one family. And that's why the Bible is saying that, you know, brethren in Christ. We are, we are not only faithful, but we are also brothers in Christ. What kind, what, what a unity that the scriptures, you know, tell us that has been established, you know, by Christ's work of uh, saving us. We are to be united in the real love, ladies and gentlemen. We are to be united in real Christian fellowship. We are to be united in mutual, you know, commitment, in mutual concern, in mutual involvement in all, in all our losses and, and crosses, you see, in all our trials and triumphs. We are to be united as brothers. And actually, one of the things that the Lord Jesus said in the book of John, he said that, you know, they will know that you are my disciples by the fact that you love one another. If you don't love one another, then that is something else. But the one thing that will show the world that you are my disciples is that you will love one another. Friends, we are brothers in Jesus Christ. How do you relate to your fellow Christians? How do you relate to your fellow believers? Do you reflect all these truths that even the word of God is telling us? When you look at how you relate to one another, do you reflect these realities in your own experience? Can you look back and, and say that that is a description of me? That is a description of me. Remember when I was praying, you know, always, you know, quoting from Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, that, you know, the word is there to rebuke us, to correct us, to teach us and to train us in righteousness so that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So let the scriptures, you know, cause you to examine yourself. If you are indeed a brother, if we are brothers in Christ, do we reflect these realities? Can you look back and say, that is a description of me? Now the Apostle Paul is setting forth you know, our status. He's saying, this is what you are, Christians. Now be who you are, okay? You have been chosen by God. Realize what that means. You have been, you know, made to be faithful. Now be faithful. You are brothers and sisters in Christ. Now act like it. The, you know, the Apostle Paul always, you know, uh, places the imperative before uh, uh, I mean, the indicative before the imperative. You know, uh, when I'm talk talking about, you know, imperative, it's a kind of commands. Yeah, imperative is all about, you know, commands. So, but indicative is an affirmation of, 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 of a fact, of, of something, you know, of who we are, you know. Paul does not always, you know, start with the imperative. He starts first with the indicative. He says what you are before he tells you what he wants you to do, Okay. Here is, and actually when he says all this, he's saying, what you are, you are a believer. Now live in accordance with what God has made you to be. Ladies and gentlemen, back to my question. When you examine yourself, when you take the scriptures and try you not know, to look to yourself, do you reflect these realities of the scriptures? The scriptures has called you a saint. The scriptures has called you brothers in Christ. The scriptures has called you faithful. Now, are these things that you know describe your life out there? Examine yourself and see. Because if faith does not lead us you know, to obedience, then that faith may be questionable. Uh, look at uh, then. Verse 2, actually this is the, um, I've said that we, are, we will focus on, on two verses and I'm moving towards you know, the conclusion. Uh, verses 2, then he said, the same, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at closing. Then, notice this, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Grace to you. Wow. What, what does Paul mean when he says grace to you and peace to you? Christians, he's actually saying that we Christians, the believers, are recipients of God's unmerited favor. We are recipients. We have received God's unmerited favor. Here Paul pronounces a blessing, a benediction on the uh, Colossian Christians. 
He says, grace, grace to you. That grace, of course, refers to God's favor toward you. This grace speaks of, uh, of, of the favor of God and blessedness of life of those who are so favored by God. We are the recipients of God's grace and merited favor and peace. And actually, the, when you look at the use of that word in this salutation or greeting, you see, it is much more than a simple greeting. It is a prayer, ladies and gentlemen, that these Colossians might enjoy the blessedness of God himself. That they might see the face of God and commune with him. How do you feel when God calls you the recipients of his favor? The recipients of, of his peace. You have the grace of God. You have the peace of God. And that's what the scripture says. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Look at, you know, let me, actually I was talking about, you know, that grace, that unmerited favor that we have received, you know, from the Lord. Like I said before, we did not, you know, deserve anything. What we deserved was, you know, to die, to spend eternity apart from God. But God, out of his riches of mercy and grace and love, he loved us and he gave us grace. Look at the second word, he said, peace. He did not only mention, talk about, you know, grace, but he talked about peace. That Christians, in virtue of God's grace, enjoy in a peace with God. And this is the second blessing. The first, I've talked about in grace, and the second is it, peace from God our Father. You know, this peace speaks of, uh, you know, spiritual prosperity. It is the healthy condition of a life experienced by the person who enjoys the favor of God. It is a peace, you know, that uh, first knows that I have, you know, been brought into a right relationship with God by trusting in Jesus Christ. And there is now nothing that can separate me from the love of Christ. That's when I feel that, you know, that I was supposed to die, I was supposed, you know, to spend eternity apart from the Lord. But when the scriptures tell me that, you know, God has loved me unconditionally, God has given me grace, God has given me peace. And now, me who was supposed, you know, to be uh, spending eternity apart from the Lord, the Lord has brought me into his family. I am called a saint. I am called a faithful brother. I am a child of God. That, ladies and gentlemen, think about it. Think about it. That brings me peace. That brings me peace. Remember, can you imagine telling you that, you know, hey, you are judged. And the penalty is that you're going to spend eternity in hell. But later on, somebody, you know, saves you. Jesus Christ, you know, comes. He saves you and he says, oh, the judgment is taken away. And you're now justified. You're not going to spend eternity in hell, but you will spend eternity in heaven. That gives you peace. Praise the Lord. Praise him for the mighty work he has done, you know, for, for our lives. Christ, you know, in virtue, we Christians in virtue of God's grace, enjoy the inner peace, inner peace with God. Hallelujah. Now, let me talk a little bit about, you know, this peace, friends. It is a peace uh, that, you know, first knows, I mean, it is, it is a peace which keeps, you know, the waters from overflowing. As overflowing as when we go through the trials of life. Because this is not a peace brought to us, you know, by circumstances, but in spite of circumstances. Now, what do I mean? What I mean is that, you know, the peace of God is not based on an absence of adverse circumstances. No, it is based on the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. No matter what, you know, we go through sometimes, you know, that claim, that attempt to take our peace away. You know, the, the, the earthly peace is temporary. Sometimes you have peace today, but tomorrow something will happen and it will take away you know, that peace. But the peace of God is not based on those, on that variety of circumstances. No, 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 no. It is based on the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. And nobody is going to take away Christ in us. He is ours forever. And that is the source. He is the source of our peace. Friends, after understanding 
after reflecting on all that, what can you give the Lord other than worshiping Him? Other than, you know, living for Him every day. The Lord who is our hope of glory. The kind of peace that we have, which is not based on, you know, <clears throat> normal circumstances. Even if, you know, uh, circumstances arise, but they cannot, you know, take that peace because it is not based on those circumstances. It is based on the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. Oh, as I'm concluding, friends, this is a kind of peace, if you read, you know, the book of Job. It's a kind of peace that, you know, enabled a godly man named Job to survive the messengers who told him that, you know, his field were lost and his animals were lost and his, you know, house were lost and his children were lost. But what happens? What was the response of Job? And yet he fell on his knees. He fell on his face and said, Blessed be the name of the Lord <clears throat> who gives and who takes away. That's the kind of uh, you know, the relationship that you know, comes you know, from our relationship with the living God. Do you know that peace and that grace? Do you know what it is to have the benediction of God pronounced on your soul? Oh, friends, if you come, if you come this day, this very day, and you have not tested that, I plead with you. I plead with you, close with Christ Jesus. If you are that kind of a person who does not even have thirst and hunger, today, Jesus' arms are open. Are open for anybody who has thirst and hunger to come to him. The moment you come to him, the moment you are united with him through the Holy Spirit, you will start, you know, hungry and having thirst for the Lord. And all these realities that I'm talking about will start, you know, overflowing oh, in your life. Come, come to the Lord. If you've never experienced all these realities that I'm talking about. Because these things that I'm talking about are in Christ, are found in Christ. And the ones who have them, they're the ones who are, are, are those ones who have been united with him. Are you in Christ? Have you been united with Christ? Do you have that hunger? If you don't, this is your time. Call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. Tell him to come into your life, to save you and to clothe you with all this blessedness. He waits. He awaits with arms open to receive you who will come to him. And if you, you, you come as a Christian today, and you have forgotten, you know, some of these uh, great realities. It is probable, you know, so many times we face challenges. That, and, and, and these challenges may cause us to forget about, you know, these realities that are, uh, we are talking about in the Word of God. These great varieties, you know, which uphold us in the midst of trial. I pray that the Spirit will bring them again to forceful remembrance in your life that we might walk in the security and the holiness that we are called to by God. Oh, friends, may the Lord bless his word. May the Lord bless all of you. As you listen to this word of God, as you go back and you take your Bible, you start, you know, eating the word of God, reflecting upon it, contemplating upon it. May the Holy Spirit, you know, visit you. May the Holy Spirit meet you. Because, you know, remember in my prayer, I said, Lord, open our eyes so that we may behold wonderful things in your word. Apart from the Holy Spirit opening our eyes and making our hearts more receptive, we are not able to do that. So ask the Lord as you read the scriptures, as you contemplate on it, and wait from him. He will do something in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this time, Lord, that we've taken to proclaim your word. My prayer is that, Lord, you will use what we've learned in your word today and make it grow in our hearts so that we will be people whom you want us you know, to be. We don't want, Lord, to be people only who talk of Christ, but who do not live a life that, you know, reflects Christ. We want to be people who live out 
what we profess. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.